We've got Tom Matuska here and I'm Mandy Swart and we are going to be talking to you today about bird and fish attachment to habitat and driftwood and bases and all sorts of fun stuff. That's one of the most difficult things for uh, a lot of taxidermists to do. They're exceptional when it comes to mounting the bird or mounting the fish and uh, I always say one of the downfalls of a really fine piece of taxidermy work is to get the fish or bird or mammal done and then say, what am I going to put it on? Um, so at the Matuska Taxidermy Supply Company, we try to make that easier for the taxidermist. Right. With all our, we have a whole line of artificial driftwood, artificial rocks and bases, and what's nice about it is your customer knows exactly what they're getting. So you can show them a picture and it's, they'll pick out which base they want, which color, oak or walnut, and there's no surprises. No surprises. We got some questions we're going to start with, but let's start first. We just got back from the Wisconsin show. It was a great show. In Stevens Point. Again, again. An awesome show. A um, couple things. The habitat there was awesome. You had the taxidermy shot with all the life-size stuff. Life-size giraffe, life-size camel, um, life-size Brahma bull, life-size longhorn steer. I mean, these are some big, big, big projects. Um, let's talk about that place, because I've been there once, and you walk in. Where is it located? Um, real close to Stevens Point. I'm not sure if it, the address is Stevens Point. Um, this is Martin Bonac, and Martin's an exceptional taxidermist and um, has found a, a, a demand for people who actually, a lot of them don't hunt or fish, yet they want maybe a sailfish, maybe a crocodile, maybe a cape buffalo in their log home or whatever it happens to be, and you can walk right in there and you can buy um, when I went in there, I would say there was a dozen Cape Buffalo of all sizes, um, full shoulder mounts. It's crazy. There's so much. You walk in and it is just full of mounts everywhere. Life size, birds, peacocks. Like peacocks. Lots peacocks. of peacocks. Mounted peacocks. Amherst. Amherst. Lady Amherst. Wisconsin. Um, oh, that's the town. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want an elephant head, they've got it. If, they had a life-size elephant or rhino or something yeah. that we took pictures of. Yeah. And if, very cool. if they don't have it, they'll fabricate it for you. Definitely um, worth it if you're in the area of walking in and worth checking the, it out. Worth the stop. And um, I think a lot of times we have customers come in and they want an elk for their the peak of their you know cathedral ceiling or whatever it happens to be. And I'm going to have to buy a set of antlers. I'm going to have to buy a cape. I'm going to have to put them together. Or I'll bet you can direct them to Martin and they can pick out any animal they want. Right. Unbelievable place. Yeah, so they had a lot of life-size mounts in the competition and just walking in, it was it was an impressive show with all the mounts there. And something about Wisconsin, I think um, of all the shows that we do, um, we learned a long time ago that if anybody goes to the Wisconsin show maybe for their first time and they're newbies and haven't done a lot of tax from your work and their work doesn't look so great, rather than talking about these new people behind their back about how poor their taxidermy work is, these guys will put their arm around them and they'll say, you need to come to my shop this weekend and let me help you with your eyes or your habitat or whatever it happens to be. Everybody in the Wisconsin show yeah. helps everybody else and you can see it by the quality of the work. Um, everybody helps everybody get to an elevated level. For it's sure. really impressive. Yeah, I saw a couple of our sculptors go and individually basically gave <laughs> A um, couple of the guys their own individual <coughs> critiques sure. on top of what the judge was getting. So they basically got three different critiques. I'm going to have to excuse Kirsten. She's sick with the class. <laughs> You'll hear her in the background. <laughs> Exceptional tax from your work. Well run show. <coughs> well run, run show. Yeah. But okay, so for those of you that are just tuning in, we are going to be talking about birds and fish and attachment to bases, habitat, um, different habitat ideas that we have that we like to do. If you have any questions on products or just in general, um, put them in the comments and we'll try to answer those as we go along. Or ideas. We get we get our okay. ideas for this from you people. Yeah. All my new products come from stuff that people push our way a lot besides the stuff that you guys craft. That's all. This guy. Um, let's see. Start with some questions. I like to use wood for standing birds and struggle with getting the branch branch in the right spot. I would assume you probably mean maybe a, um, a wall mount maybe. And we've struggled with that also. You know, we buy wood for the supply company, so we have 
um, a selection of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of uh, driftwood and even I will go down there and I will look through, I will spend half hour to 45 minutes just picking that right piece of driftwood. When I find it, I think, oh man, that is perfect, but it's a one-time deal. I used it for that standing pheasant and that's, that's it. I can't use it for another pheasant. Um, that brought us to the idea of what if we picked out a really nice piece of wood or two and we made molds of it and we made it in the, uh, make it in the supply company. Um, where do we have one here? This is, this is a, uh, this is lightweight. Any of our wood is made out of 10 pound density foam. This stuff is so strong. Um, if you look at some of our, our early YouTube videos, I even bet Mandy that I could drive over a rock and not damage it with my truck. Um, it's a true that's, story. It's a true story. Uh, it's the same um, driftwood that we, or same foam that we use on a driftwood. So this was a piece of driftwood. Um, the branch was off to the side. We altered it a little bit so it's kind of centered. Um, it's made out of, like I said, the 10 pound density foam. Um, our habitat department paints this into a, a natural driftwood. It comes in what, cedar? Yep. And we have a cedar color, which would be this guy here that gives you the natural cedar color. Yep. And then the weathered, which is like a gray tone. Like and this is the weathered. Now with something like this, um, this is perpendicular to the floor. A pheasant will sit on there really nice. A we also have will sit wood, on there. wood built into the perch. Oh, yeah. for Any of these fish. branches, wherever you have a thin branch, they're all reinforced with plywood on the inside. Um, so you're not just drilling through foam to put your uh, bird wires on. You're actually going down through a piece of wood also. Now you take something like this, and depending on the habitat, or Whatever that, whoops, you got the grasses over there. Hand me some grasses. Thank you. Um, you can, uh, we've got cover grass. You can take some something like this. You can enhance it with, not the whole bundle, but a few sprigs of this. This uh, cover grass is great. Um, I'll get a little closer. We get this shipped um, overseas, and it comes in, I think we have seven different colors, and you can spread it apart, and you get a lot of... Oh, it goes, it, yeah, it lasts ways. forever. You don't use the whole bundle. Um, I had a lady work for me one time and she was doing habitat and I couldn't find her. And I went outside and in the parking lot, on the fringe of the parking lot, she's on her hands and knees. And I said, what are you doing? And it was Barb Tagami. And she was studying how grass grows and just weeds where we didn't get mowed. And she was down looking at how many strands are in the clumps and how far apart the clumps are. And I thought, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of, but grass does not grow like that, like this big old bundle. Um, to be honest, did you go out and do it later on? I do, I do it like that. <laughs> yeah, I never studied it, but I learned from her. Um, little sprigs here, little sprigs here, three or four little bundles to adorn your mount. Um, something like this could be used for um, absolutely anything. Uh, Jesse, Hayes from uh, Wisconsin had a weasel that he did exceptionally well in. I mean, you can do a, put a little weasel climbing up here. You can put a little, some branches, some habitat in here. Um, you can put some snow on it. All different ways to adorn this to make it look real. But this is our, our perch branches, real nice and strong. It'll hold any size bird. Um, Ashley says, awesome shirts. Thanks, Ashley. These are actually our new uh, taxidermy shirts. So. If you turn around, oh. yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, taxidermy, Greek word for taxi to move, and derma, the skin. And then the art of preserving and preparing the skins of animals with lifelike effect for the purpose of education, display, or study. We kind of took the Webster Dictionary, our definition, and merged them together to get... That's a Greek this. word? Apparently. Really? They know more than just yogurt? Yes. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Not a fan of Greek yogurt. <laughs> um, all right, let's let's talk. How do you attach your artificial rocks? Like these are my artificial rocks, right? Yeah. Um, these are ultra ultra strong. Again, ten pound density foam, but they're so hard, can't even break a window with them. You can do anything oh with these things. Um, I like to take these. 
and I will take a piece of driftwood. It could be real driftwood. Here we have a piece of real driftwood, um, but especially on fish. We do a lot of fish here, so, so I'm either using a real piece or I'm using an artificial piece, but I, I find that customers really, really like it if you can adorn it with some rocks. Driftwood's great. To me, the more elements that you add to your habitat to a point, you can get go over the top too, a little too far, but the more elements you add to it, it makes it real realistic. So I want to do something like this. I will take, we have these little rock clusters, and I made it purposely so I didn't have to put on one rock at a time. Um, I would find a place where this little rock cluster is <coughs> now, like that. I will lay it on a flat table. I take long, um, either landscape screws, depending on how thick your rock cluster is, landscape screws or torque head screws, and I'll find a crack where two rocks go together, and I will screw it through the rock into the real driftwood or the artificial driftwood, and I will actually sink the head. I'll sink the head probably a quarter inch below the surface of the foam rock. And then I will also do it from another direction. That leaves you with a hole with a screw head down inside of it. Um, a lot of times on my fish I will add uh, moss like this, and so that's a perfect place. A little piece of moss over that screw head, a little piece of moss over that screw head, a little piece of moss up on here, and you can really, really enhance your wood displays. Um, these are great. You can add, um, do single rocks. These are single rocks. These are all individually painted, and the girls that paint these actually have real rocks in front of them to go by. Um, you can do the same thing with these. You can tuck those under there. You can add one on top. And we have a couple different kinds, so styles. One would be the river rock, which has either speckles or some striping to it, and they're flat and smooth. And then we also have the field rock, which would have the more textured look to it. This would be a little bit more like field rock. It's got a little rougher texture, something you'd find out in the field. Um, this would be more of a lake shore, like I think our, the ones that we have came from Lake Michigan, right on the shores of Lake Michigan. All right, let's talk some attachment to bases for as far as the birds and fish. Okay. Um, I have done a lot of things to attach fish especially. And looking back, I had some pretty poor attachment methods. I used to take a piece of wood, piece of, and we call it driftwood. It doesn't have to be driftwood, you know, out of the lake. It can just be, you know, a piece of nice wood, a piece of cedar or something like that. I would take my wood, I would drill two holes in there, like say three eighths inch holes. I would sharpen dowel rods like pencils. I would Elmer screw them into the wood with two dowel rods coming out. I'd take my fish, I'd line him up, and I'd put little poke holes through the skin, and I would force him onto the dowels. And that's the way not to do it. It worked wonderful for 30 some years until I think Jim Kimball, when Jim Kimball worked for me, he t attached his birds on a heavy wire and I kind of just adapted that to um, my fish taxidermy. So what we do now, and there's a lot of different ways to do this, but I take the body before I mount the fish, I drill a hole in the back, and I bondo a strong wire. This has a number six gauge wire. That's a pretty stout wire. It's bondoed into my body. When I mount the fish, the wire is coming out of the back. On a big fish, I might, instead of wire, I might use a threaded rod. This is a trout that's gonna be ready for base work pretty soon. We auto body puttied in a threaded rod. This is our mounting stance. It's just a piece of plywood with a two by two post. Holds it really, really strong. I can tip him up, work on him. I can tip him down. Um, once he's mounted, they go onto a stand like this. All of my epoxy work is done while he's on the stand. All of our painting is done while he's on the stand. Okay, so now on the, on the bigger fish like that, you can just uh, take your wood, let's find a piece of wood here, take your wood, drill a hole where you want the rod to go through, I recess it on the back side from my nuts, I would put the fish on here, tighten down my nuts, and then I would cut off the threaded rod on the back. And then I would tighten it up really, really tight. Even when it's tight, you can force that fish up a little bit or down a little bit. Customers like that. Um, if a customer were ever to say, oh, I was hoping he'd be fighting up a little stronger, 
tip him up, you know, you change the whole attitude of the fish. On, uh, if I have a wire, which I use on any of my, oh, I suppose fish up to about um, six, seven pounds, I have a wire in there. I, I countersink a spot with a spade bit in the back. I stick my wire through, bend it over. I use two to three little screws on the back to hold that wire secure. Before I give it to the customer, I fill that with auto body putty. When it gels, I rasp it off smooth and it looks real professional. Now, with a setup like this, I can, I can tip, whoops, tip that fish up a little bit. I can tip that fish down a little bit. I could have him swimming out by bending him like that. That wire is real bendable. So what gauge wire are you using? This is like six, this is heavy. Six gauge. On so the bigger do you fish, I'll use the six. galvanized or the annealed? We don't have six in the annealed. I think we will get it because the annealed is a little more bendable and user friendly. The galvanized has a little bit of spring to it. I would choose annealed if I had the choice. And the big wire, I don't. Right. We don't have it. But uh, the wire looks works really good. You hide it in the back. It's super strong. Um, threaded rods for your bigger fish. When it comes to birds, we do a bird the same way. We stick the wire through the bird. Um, you can even auto body putty it into your body before you mount the bird. Then when you mount the bird, stick it through your mounting plate, your habitat post, fence post, whatever it happens to be. Drill your, your um, countersink holes on the back with a spade bit, bend the wire over. And to help you bend the wire over, I use a really small little pipe. Um, I've seen you put it in your mounting stand before too. I've done it in a mounting stand, yeah, anything to bend it over. And then I snip it off to length, put a screw on each side, and that screw will hold it really, really secure. Yeah, this is a pipe. I take a little pipe like that, line it up how much wire I, have, I want between the fish and the driftwood, stick this on my wire, bend it over like that, snip it off, screw on each side, holds it. Um, really, really strong. And you can adjust the bird any direction you want. It's very strong. Do you cover the wire with epoxy or leave it plain? I usually, I think they're talking about the back. I do auto body putty, or epoxy's fine. Auto body putty, as soon as it gels, I take a rasp and rasp it off. Looks a little more professional. Um, Randy Wold wants to know, in the fish, the rod straight in or bent? The rod bent. bent. Um, that was a very good question. Um, I will have, like on, on this fish, I probably have a, I started out with maybe an eight inch piece of rod and I drilled a hole in the back of the fish and then I take a spade bit and I go either one direction or the other and then I'll bend an L on my rod and make sure that it fits down in there, fill the hole with auto body putty, stick my rod in so it comes straight out the back of the fish and let it set up. And then usually I might have to rasp it off, rasp off any overflow in the back. So bent, yeah. You don't want to be turning this and have it have it spin. All right. Um, well, let's talk, since we're talking attachment, let's talk about these Well, that's guys. a good attachment. Um, these, are, these are steel square stock, and we've been able to find brass square tubing which fits perfectly into there. There is no wiggle whatsoever. And I would use this on, uh, I've done it on competition pieces. You can cut it too. You, you can cut it to any size you want, any length you want. So say I have a fish and this is my, um, let's use this one, maybe a little bluegill going after a, a worm on the bottom and I want him to touch just at one spot. These come in different sizes. You got the yeah, little one there? a small and a large. I can't get that thick part out though. Here's a, Here's a little guy. It's not gonna work. Oh, sure. That's not gonna work either. Did you try it? Yep. Oh. Okay, give me the big one. Oh, you probably got it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this can either go down in here, or this can go in. One has to go in the fish, one has to go into the mm -hmm. base. Um, one of the students in, we have students now, one of the students just did an otter on a little bit bigger version of this. But uh, I would take, I'd take the fish and the rod, I'd cut off the length that I'd need. So say you're gonna have, you don't need a lot, um, say I'm gonna have about three inches. I would drill a hole down into my base, I would 
put this down in there. Don't glue it yet. Just, just have about three inches sticking up. Then I would line up where the fish is going to go. I would drill a hole in the fish's breast or you know, side or wherever it's going to touch. You can have it out the side too. You can have it a real discreet, just barely swimming by touching. Um, my rule for any of my attachments is I want the viewer to look at it and say, how did you do that? That's the best compliment you can get. Um, rather than a pheasant flushing with a corn stalk up his butt, I don't like that kind of so much. Um, anyway, so you got the rod coming out of the base. You've got a hole up in the fish. I will slide the fish down, make sure everything aligns. Then I'll usually auto body putty. I will put it together. Oh baby. Somehow I'll put it together. I'll put it together. I'll put auto body putty up into the fish wherever wherever my hole is. Slide my female brass rod up in there and then I will just set it back on top of here for a second till that gels. When it gels, I will take him off. I will put auto body putty down in this hole. Five minute epoxy, you can do that too. And then I would put the fish on there with the male and female inserts in the fish in the wood. As Soon as it hardens, the fish should be able to slip off, slip on, slip off, slip on. If anything went wrong, you have a few minutes that you could grab this with a vice grip and twist it out. You know, we've done that before, like, oh no, he's crooked, you know, um, that happens. So you don't want to have to be bending this when it's in the fish. But uh, these are great attachments for fish. Um, smaller mammals, you know, don't get too big of things. Um, and it's a real secure, and it indexes good together, good for travel. Um, for those of you that are just tuning in, we are talking about fish and bird attachment, habitat, driftwood, rocks, all our bases and whatnot. Um, you can find all of our stuff that we're talking about online um, at www.matuskataxidermy.com or call us um, and we can walk you through that. Feel free to put in any questions in the comments that you have about driftwood or attachments, um, habitat, all that. and. This guy will answer them Rocks for you. and mosses and grasses and... We got it all. Dirt. 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 We got dirt. We sell <laughs> dirt. We sell a lot of dirt. It's a big seller. Um, let's see. A lot of people are using the artificial driftwood. What's the benefits from are the artificial to the tumbled cedar? My benefit is, like I said earlier, I can go down where we store our driftwood and I can spend half hour to 45 minutes of finding just that perfect piece for a walleye or a bass, for instance. That piece would make me happy with every walleye and bass I use because it, it just fits that style of fish. Um, so when we made the artificial ones, we tried to pick out perfect pieces for that type of a fish and make molds of them. Um, and they can be turned any direction. They can be hung upside down, well, upside down to you. They're right side up to me. Uh, but like uh, this one comes with or without rocks and this is perfect for a small bass, big crappie, you know, big bluegill type of fish, small mouth, um, you got rocks. Um, we will do something like, I'll put a little moss in here. I always take a, um, a little spinner, that's kind of my trademark, a little line and a spinner and a little um, fluorescent bead on it. So anybody that sees a fish mounted somewhere and that's done like that around here, um, that's kind of what we do. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, a lot of times we'll put a little wood oval with mounted by the Matuska Taxidermy Studio, or we will have the customer's trophy plate on there. It says how big the fish is caught by. Um, so anyway, that, the advantage to me is I have a piece that I know will fit. I know that that fish is gonna fit, you know, a crappie or a small, small mouth or a bass. But you also don't wanna give that guy the same driftwood as that guy, as that guy. You don't want to have everybody have the same thing. That's why we've mixed them up as far as colors. You can place the rocks in strategic locations. Um, you can remove branches, you can add branches, um, you can add moss, um, you can tip them different directions. Um, you know, you can do something like that and people don't even recognize it as being the same piece of, of wood. Um, and there's 
Another thing, another big thing for that is weight. This piece of driftwood, look at that one. This is tumbled cedar driftwood from Texas. Pretty heavy, huh? Mm -hmm. um, now that's a small piece. We do a lot of big, big fish, like uh, muskies and northerns, and they take, I would always have to take several larges or jumbos and put them together. And it doesn't take three pieces of jumbo driftwood put together and you've got 25 pounds of driftwood hanging on the wall. Then you add a heavy reproduction or a big mounted fish on it and you can pretty easily end up with a 30 pound trophy on the wall which is plenty heavy. Whereas these things weigh ounces, they're very lightweight. That's something that you did. Tell us how you did that. On one of our mounts you took this piece two of these, flipped them, and connected them. I did a, a cropping. We always have attached um, real wood together. Like we would take this wood and we would find another matching color, the tones are matching, and slide them together. Might have to cut them on a bandsaw to make them index a little bit. Then we take great big long um, landscape screws and pre-drill the holes and we would screw these together on a flat surface so they stay as one unit, you know, so you couldn't tell if it was you know, two or one, except you probably have a void where the two came together. And then, using auto body putty, we oftentimes fill the voids, and then we texture it. We'll even color the auto body putty with like oil paints, and then texture it with, um, oh, maybe a lacquer, lacquer on a cheap paintbrush, because you're gonna ruin the paintbrush, and then paint it to match the wood. So we always did that with our um, real driftwood, and it works really good with the artificial drink. Because it's also. the foam. Yeah, because it's foam. Got it. And it makes it really strong and looks good. So can you connect it with the foam or no, you'd rather use the You, could, you could connect it with foam. I like to use auto body putty just for strength. I don't want them hanging up and all of a sudden one of my branches break off. Or... You're kind of spoiled with the real driftwood because you can go down and pick out anything you want. Where customers, if you're getting it shipped to you, you're at the mercy of us pulling your order and whatever we think we want to put in there. Where this, again, it's your customer, hey, do you like this piece? This is the exact one you're gonna get, there's no questions. Um, we are spoiled, like I'll, I'll go into the supply room and look for rocks and I have an idea what I want, but I don't know from the catalog picture exactly how big they are, and uh, I could order and I could actually get, I mean, we have measurements in there, but I could actually get that when I really wanted something like this, you know, yep. so. In the catalog, I think those are very close in the same size. Really? Well, I mean, the picture-wise, picture yeah. Uh, and these, you can do all kinds of things. You could take, to, to get it, make it really, really simple, um, these are some fabulous. That rock is the same rock as that's on here, actually. Fabulous bases that index into Thomas um, John. walnut hollow. I turned mine off, didn't I? No. Nope. Um, <laughs> that index into walnut guy. hollow bases. Okay, now, I don't know what, is there a price on this? These are like the best deal going in tax for me for quality bases. There. We actually sold out of all of our habitat at the Wisconsin show. Um, it was flying off the shelves at the Wisconsin show. And there's show. quite a bit of people that competed with them, which was really cool to see, oh, yeah. I love it. We had, just a story about that, um, we had a young man that had an otter. 89.50. 89.50? Yep. Um, for and both pieces? For both pieces. Yep. And that's a walnut hollow. If you hollow, were to this buy is... this separate, this would be painted forty-seven twenty-five, and we also offer a less expensive version that's a natural wash, and that would be fifteen ninety-five. So you could get this with a natural wash of fifteen ninety-five, and then just add your colors of what you want. If you're real creative and like to paint, um, the, you you should watch the girls paint these. Every one of these rocks is painted individually. Yep. And they get fast at it, but that looks as real as you could ever get. Um, but we had a we had a, a contestant at the Wisconsin show. Mark that, Meyer, I'm calling you out. <laughs> that had an otter that had a his attachment. He wasn't happy with it, his attachment, and he came to the booth. And is this the one he got? Something like this? No, one? it was a kidney one. Oh, this the... one. Oh, and, yep, definitely. Yeah, and, it was uh, this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me what he was going to do, and it's. You know this thing's starting. You you can't be doing that now. And I, I two hours. I think he had two hours. Two hours to to take his otter off the old base and put it on one of our bases. And I just I thought this can't go well. And it was a beautiful, it looked nice. beautiful mount. It looked beautiful really mount. Nice. It was touching down by one one foot as it was swimming down. And there was really nothing nice. more to the habitat. It was the base and then the beautiful otter. Like it was yeah. very nice looking.
Now Walnut Hollow, we have all kinds of configurations um, of these bases, and these have recessed areas to either accept one that you're going to make your own or something of ours like this. Um, you can also get them that are flat on the top. You could take that, a big old wad of hot glue, stick it down on, a um, couple little duckweeds on here, and it'd be a great thing for a mallard to stand on to make it simple and inexpensive. I like that. That's one of our bigger ones, and then this is another yeah. size. These are the best rocks ever. Now, when you add your habitat, are you using super glue or hot glue? Hot glue, typically. Um, I use I use a lot of moss, and we will sometimes use real moss. Is this called? What's this called? Moss mat. Moss mat. Um, I like this one. It's it's artificial, and it comes on a mat. Hence the word moss mat. I would assume. But it's too thick and it's too lush and a little on the phony side. But if you take this moss mat uh -huh. and you separate it, <laughs> you separate it and you pull it apart and use pieces, um, I usually take a scissors and trim off the gray connecting fabric, but um, you can, you can make, yeah, stick to my fingers, um, you can, it's a good matte moss color that does not fade. Here, um, we also have dyed real moss. Here's on one of our driftwood pieces there. It's kind of attached um, to it. I just like, uh, I like mossy stuff on my fish. Do I don't like want to overdo it because you're going to make a dust collector. Um, but we do have, like I said, the, the preserved real moss. Um, and that works also. And I just put a little hot glue down. I put it over my screw holes. I put it over any blems that I want to hide. I do it just for um, making things look better. Sometimes if it's a, a dry, like out in the field where a pheasant would be, or uh, maybe a small mammal, I will spray this with Elmer's glue and water and take my real moss and I will crinkle it. So it just debris falls on there and I call it ground clutter. Uh, pine needles. So how for do you get that to stick then? Your Elmer's glue and water will stick it on and no, as it dries it, clear. As it dries clear. As it's drying, you can push it down and you might want to give it one more spritz over the top. But uh, ground cover on some uh, habitat mounts is a huge lifelike thing. Do you gloss the moss to make it look wet? I, I, this one I have glossed a little bit and I don't want them. I don't know, it's kind of funny because I gloss my fish to a high shine, you know, like this rainbow, and I give the wood a little luster, but I don't give it the wet, wet look. That's kind of a personal preference, I guess. Um, driftwood. Um, your habitat in driftwood, do you ever have to worry about bugs, insects? Um, yes. Now... You notice when I was talking before, I was talking about the cedar driftwood. Bugs, insects will infest any kind of wood. I've had them in oak, I've had them in walnut, I've had them in any kind of wood. And um, little boar beetles, when I first started in the taxidermy business, I was getting my wood from a um, sawmill and I had these really nice live edge bark walnut panels. And I did a walleye for a guy. And he called me up like frantic, ready to sue me because his wood had termites. And first of all, I didn't believe it. And uh, I said, you gotta bring it in, let me see, you know, but I'm kind of scared, you know, I've got given the guy termites and they're gonna eat his house. And so he brought it in and it, it was a piece of walnut where it has light grain and, and dark grain. And wherever the light grain was, it was evidently softer. And it looked like you took a little 16th inch drill bit and drilled 10,000 holes in this whole thing. And he said he noticed it because he had sawdust on his floor. Now this is a piece of walnut. So bugs will infest any kind of wood. They can eat any kind of wood. The cedar is bug proof. It's got its own odor that evidently cedar or that insects don't like. If you're ever gonna pick something up off the river or off the shores that's not cedar, you are gonna wanna treat it for insects. And we do that with a product called Malathion, which is very strong. It has a terrible, terrible odor. 
Um, you can get it in any garden center, any you know, uh, farm store, that sort of thing. They treat grain bins with it, box cars with it. Um, we mix it with water, you dilute it, spray it on. So if we have a lot of driftwood, we would put it in a garden sprayer and actually drench them with it. Um, it smells so bad, it can't be good for you. That's another thing we like. A bug's not gonna eat our foam that we know of. Um, but cedar, if you're gonna, you know, even the cedar breaks like out west, um, Wyoming and South Dakota, they have the cedar breaks and there's gnarly pieces of cedar. That's excellent and insects won't bother that. Uh, my brother has a walleye that has been in the freezer for 20 years. I wonder if that fish is way too freezer burnt to taxidermy. I was going to say it's been at your shop. <laughs> uh, I did too when I did it. <laughs> um, uh, things do slip through the cracks. Uh, <laughs> fish are surprisingly resilient to freezer burn, and I have mounted some very, very old fish that have been in the freezer for a long time. And most often, you can revive them to a nice mount <laughs> with soaking. It'll take some soaking. It might take some skin softeners like Ultra Soft or a product like that, but they will soften up. And if the fins are too bad, um, you can get artificial fins for that fish also. Um, what hardware do I need to attach a flying duck to driftwood? Um, I've mentioned that before, but we use we use a wood system, or I mean a metal rod system, just like just like that. I I bend a big long candy cane, sharpen on both ends, wire, and I stick it through the body. A couple different ways to do it. Um, you can stick it through the body after the bird's mounted, so you have a wire coming out real secure. Or you cannot drill a hole in your bird body. Make sure it's not going to be where you're going to stick your wires and wire your bird. You can auto body putty that wire in there. And then when you get ready to mount the bird, figure out where that wire is in relationship to his legs and wings. Make a tiny little cut in the skin. Slide the wire through. Wire in your wings, wire in your legs. And when he's completely done, you have a really strong wire coming out that you can attach to any of these. Um. Water seams. Let's talk water seams. How do you create water seams? Um, there's a lot of different water seam products, and for years we've used. Um, everybody sells it by a different name, but it's basically um, uh, polyester resin in a clear version. Um, it's called uh, clear scenery resin that you know the paperweights are made of. Um, water clear resin. Um, there's all different kinds of words for it. But basically, it's a polyester resin like fiberglass. Fiberglass is made up of two components. It's made up of fiber, which is the cloth or the mat, and it's made up of glass, which is the liquid resin that hardens into a plastic glass. So this would be the clear version of that. Um, first of all, if you're going to do water, you're going to need a recess of some sort, or your water is going to run everywhere and off the table and, and make a mess. So I would... I would, for instance, <clears throat> if I wanted to create a water seam in this recess, I would first color this. Sometimes you're going to have wood grain show through, so that's not always pretty. Um, I have taken pieces of plexiglass and cut it so it fits down in there real good and painted the back of it black or, or watercolor. Stick it down in. You could do something like... Um, Put a little rock cluster in there. Take the clear scenery resin. You don't want to pour clear scenery resin very thick. You want to build it up little at a time. I would maybe mix it up. You mix up um, methyl ethyl ketone peroxide as the catalyst. You put a little bit of catalyst in there and it comes with directions. Either it goes by drops or it goes by, by weight. Um, you will pour it in there and let it set up. Let it cure for about a day. You can add another layer another layer and another layer until you get it as high as you want. Usually on your last, if this were a bird for instance, a duck maybe, I'd take some, we've got some beautiful little um, artificial pond weed, you can sprinkle that on the top, you can put moss in there, you can put a little snail shell, clam shells, and you would have a nice little water scene. <clears throat> the thing about water scenes is they look exceptional when you give them to the customer, a year later they don't look so good because they've been dusting them and they've been wiping cloth over them and clear water doesn't look like water down the road. So it's nice, I try to talk customers into 
um, glass boxes for water stains. Yeah. And there's a lot. You could pour you could pour the artificial water on here and let it run down and make it look like it's real wet. Um, there's a lot of different ways to use it. There's also polyurethane water, which we make our bird heads out of polyurethane. It's a two-part white plastic. They also make that in clear. And um, that's a equal amounts. You pour A and B together, mix them together so there's no swirls in it, and that's another pretty good water clear resin. And if you ever want to do that, don't do it on a customer. It's the first thing. Get some and play with it. Come up with ideas as you're working with it. Mix two just to see how it acts. How long does it take to set up? Um, it'll, you know, you can learn a lot by playing with it. Why has something happened with one of your customers that? What's that? Well, I don't know. You said don't practice on a customer. Oh, everything. I've had everything happen. Um, everything happen. Things, uh, the EPA is always changing all of these things. Like I always tell you, this was, what this is made of, that foam was not made for the taxidermy industry. Um, the plastic that this fish head was made of is not made for the taxidermy industry. And as, you know, manufacturing goes on, recipes get changed for one reason or another. And we always poured our, our clear water on foam seams. And all of a sudden I had a swan base that was about the size of this table. And I had a swan standing in it. And I poured a nice layer of water. I had pond weed, I had grasses, I had, you know, clam shells, things like that. And all of a sudden, what the heck? I've got geysers of bubbles coming up through my foam. And it's the new foam reacts with the water scene. You have to seal your foam or it will, Old Faithful comes up through your foam in bubbles. So what do you seal it with? Um, you can seal it with uh, uh, Mod Podge. You can seal it. We use something called, it's a smooth on product called Epsilon. And it's nothing more than epoxy, a uh, two part clear epoxy that we have to paint our bases with to keep the gases from the foam from seeping into your water. Got it. Um, for attaching your rocks and bases to the hardwood, what's your process for that? Depends on depends on what you've got, what's going on, it, how secure you want it. Um, you know, if I had a little tiny turtle climbing up on here, I'd take a lot of hot glue, stick it down, and it's on there for good. It's going to bond to the rock. It's going to bond to the wood. Um, if it's something where you've got a pretty big duck and it, you need a little more stability, I would probably countersink a couple screws. I put some glue on you. You take five minute epoxy and whatever. Put some glue on there run a couple screws, counter sink them in there. Um, glue and then when you glue put, when you attach those, say you're doing it with this, and you're using these rods, do you go through to the wood or just the rock? With the animal? With yeah. With the bird? Um, I'm not a big person for, um, like for instance on here, I'm not a big person for sticking the wires down through and doubling them over. People have done that for years and years and years. Um, I like to be able to slip my bird off maybe paint his feet or whatever I happen to do and slip him back on. Um, I don't want him attached permanently the minute I get him mounted. Um, once I think he's ready for the base, so I leave my wires maybe two inches and anytime you add any kind of leg wires onto a base, make sure they are perfectly parallel and straight. No bent wires, nothing like this. It's gonna cause you all kinds of problems. Um, when they're perfect and straight, drill holes where they go slip him down on there. When you're ready, you got all your habitat done and everything's ready to go, I slip him off. I put two-part epoxy. Elmer's glue works good too. Um, usually use five-minute epoxy, stick it on there, slide him down in, and he's on there forever. So same with these R bases, our pre-made bases? Sure. For the attachment? Bondo or you do? To attach this to that? I Bondo would be great. They'll never come off with Bondo. You could do that. Um, you could even screw them down in. Um, sometimes I have even found myself, I change things as, you know, I'm doing something and I gotta do this down and dirty really quick. I'll take a couple sheetrock screws and go, screw, screw, it's fastened down, little piece of moss, little piece of moss. You know, that's a dirty, easy, easy, fast, yeah. dirty, easy way to do it. <laughs> Non-professional. Um. At what point, like when and how do you install wire that attaches the bird to the driftwood. What part of the mounting process? The wire to the bird? Yes. Um, 
I, eat, I do it one of two ways. I will put it in a body first, and then I will usually um, use auto body putty to put it in, or some, some people will just make a little candy cane hook on it and stick it all the way through the body and then bend it so it can't come back out. That's one time. And then the only problem with that is you have to work around that long wire as you're mounting a bird. You have to stick it through the skin, make a hole in the skin, stick it through, then you have to wire the neck and wings and legs. Um, so you have to work around that wire, which is sometimes uncomfortable. Um, oftentimes I will take the bird, I will semi-pose him once he's sewn up, I will semi-pose him in the pose that I want. I will take a long wire, sharpen it needle sharp on both ends, um, and then I will make a hook on one end. I will figure out, to figure out where he, where he is attached, say he's gonna be on a piece of wood like this, and he's gonna be flushing like that. I want it coming out under his right wing. I want it going in under this wing, his left wing. So I will take those long Euro pins and get an idea of where I want it to go in, where I want it to come out. Then I will take that long wire and I will stick it through the body. When I get to the candy cane hook, I pound it into the side of the body and then attach it to my wood, whether it's real wood or artificial wood or rocks or whatever. Um, let's see, snow. Let's talk snow and dirt. Um, I didn't bring my one snow. You got snow? Oh. We sell, and it's, it's hard for us to find, but it's sheet snow we had the reason i ever started looking for it was i had people that wanted to do ice fishing scenes so i searched and found sheets of of it's um floral foam and it's craft floral foam you will see it in hobby lobbies in the shape of christmas trees or wreaths around christmas time but we got it in a big big sheet and i would cut out an ice surface for my ice fishing displays so I would take that, that two inch piece of, of um, it, it's the same stuff like this, only this is shredded. And I will fasten it up here and then I will shape the edges so it's nice and rounded. Um, a lot of times I'll cut a little ice hole out of it. I will cut a little ice hole out of it. Um, you can put some wigglers up there, you can put um, a fishing pole, bobbers, you know, whatever fishermen lay on the ice, a little Copenhagen can, you know, that sort of thing. Um, on the underneath side, I like to take the polyester resin we were taking, talking about using for water, and I would tip it upside down and pour it on that foam, and it eats that foam. But the object is, it only eats it so much, and then it sets up really hard. And so you have a water-looking, uneven surface because it ate it on the underneath side of the ice, and the top of the ice looks like fresh fallen snow. Um, I'd even put boot prints in it. You know, you can you can put it on the floor and step on it with a gridded shoe. Yeah, and boot. Yeah, looks like fishermen are standing there. Um, and the way I ever started using that is we, um, several years ago, I had a lot of polar bears to do. Not a lot. One. A couple polar bears a year. <laughs> um, but uh, when, they, when they made it legal for them to come in, a lot of people had them stored up in Canada. So we did a few of them. And people wanted things like, like ice flows with seal holes and things like that. And holy smokes, you know, I went from mountain raccoons to a polar bear. Um, I would cut that floral foam in thin, thin shingle-like pieces and I would put over, over my base and then I would paint it with that uh, polyester resin, the clear stuff, and it would melt it and it would fuse it all together. And I thought, wow, that looks kind of cool. And you keep adding and building it up. And we made some really exceptional looking um, Ice flows with seal blow holes, holes in it, and looks real nice. Um, what's nice about this is this one has like the not glitter, but it gives it the wet look yeah. of snow, looks where then our normal flocking doesn't have that. So you can add it together to give it a good full yet glistening snow look. And this looks real nice. There's a lot of different ways to use this. Um, if you want just a dusting, you can. Uh, spray your base with, um, we use a lot of Elmer's glue and water in an atomizer model. You can spray that or you can spray spray adhesive. Spray adhesive scares me a little bit. I, I'm afraid some of it yellows. Um, then you sprinkle the snow on. It looks like just freshly fallen snow. Or um, some people I've seen mix this with clear um, 
um, silicone caulk into kind of a paste and you can build it up oh, kind of thick and then put fresh on top and actually shape shape a little snow pile. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, we've taken um, foam, like our two-part foam that the mannequins are made of, and we've poured a little mound of it, like a, like snow fell on here and then it starts melting, you know, and uh, then put this on top of it, painted paint it flat white and then glue this on top of it. You can be creative, you can come up with a lot of fun fun looking snow scenes. There again, any of your snow, th snow scenes um, are real dust collectors. They look exceptional when they're done, not so much a couple years down the road. Air can, it's a good sprayer to get it off, clean it. Um, dirt is the same, so we have used the Elmer's glue and water for the bases, and then mixture, would you say half and half, or mainly it water? It takes more, it takes probably uh, two thirds water and one third glue it's got to be able to spray through those squirt bottles, right. like a Windex type bottle. And then you put the dirt on top, pat it down. You can spray on top of that because it dries clear. Yeah, like if I was doing, if I wanted, a, if I wanted this to be a mound of dirt, and we sell regular mounds just so people don't have to make them, I would cut out a little piece of wood about this size. I would cover it with foam. I would rasp the foam to my shape that I want. I would paint it with straight Elmer's glue. Usually it works best if you seal it with a thin down Elmer's glue first, then paint it with straight Elmer's glue, pack your dirt on it, let it dry, shake off all of the excess ground debris, dirt, gravel, sand, whatever you want to do, and then saturate it on the top with a mixture of probably, two. we, we say 50-50 Elmer's glue and water, but it's more water than Elmer's glue. And once it's done, it should be really nice and strong without a lot of, you don't want the stuff crumbling dirt off on the customer's coffee table. That's what I'm after. Right. So you seal it after? I seal it um, after, and I might even seal it a couple times. And the Elmer glue dries, not, it dries flat. It's not a glossy shine, so if you want a gloss after, you can come and hit it with gloss too. You can make mud out of it. So you're sealing it with the Elmer's glue water? Yes. And then a couple times, and Probably then if you want to gloss it, you can gloss yep. it. Yep. Let it dry completely, and you can come in with a spray can of gloss, or you can pour resin over it or any kind of gloss. Um, that's pretty much all the questions we have. What about this? Oh my goodness, I totally forgot. Out of sight, out of mind. This, this is like one of my favorites. This is... An octagon barnwood base. This is a... Uh, um, we had a customer who, who uh, wanted a pedestal deer and he's a young man and I said, if you bring me something to attach your deer to, um, you know, it'll help out. I don't have to go hunt for something and might cheapen up your pedestal mount. He brought me in like a eight foot bridge timber. This thing weighed a hundred and some pounds. And I let it sit in the corner for months because I didn't know how I was ever going to make a mount or, you know, attach his mount to it. And one day we thought, what if we made a base out of that thing? So. This, this is a, from an old, old bridge, and we made an octagon pedestal base like this, and we made a rubber mold of it, and now you can get these. These are cheap. How much are they? For $86.95. I mean, you can't build that, and this is, this is super strong. You could drive on this, too. You're not going yeah, to hurt it. Now, you could use that for a turkey. You know, a turkey would sit in there. You do all your habitat and everything, build up a little... You little had the mule deer on it. I think ground. the deer's on the back cover. Yeah, we have the pedestal deer oh, on the back there. cover. Oh, yeah. And the turkey. Um, these are great. And they look really real. They do. It has all the detail that it, the normal one had. And the thing has got away. 25 pounds. Got a question. Heavy duty. Do you have to go to a college for taxidermy? Daryl. That's a good question. There's a lot of people that are trying to do YouTube and self-teach and watch videos and all that. Um, what we offer here is we offer a nine-week residential course, Northwest Iowa School of Taxidermy. Um, you are taught by three award-winning taxidermist instructors, and they are awesome. They do a great job. Tell them about it. Um, trying to learn taxidermy on your own is very difficult. I tried it. Few are able to do that. Some people are. Um, now with the advent of 
you know, YouTube and DVD, you know, you watch enough things, maybe, maybe it's easier. But when I started, you almost need somebody there to say, you know, yes, you're doing it right, or no, you're doing it wrong, or try this, or try that, or try this tool, try that tool. Um, at the Northwest Iowa School of Tax, for me, when we began in 19, ooh, man, 86 or 88 or something like that, <clears throat> um, you weren't even thought of then. Um, but we were only one of three schools in the United States. We were one of three. Um, many have, you know, started up and, and closed down since then. Um, but it, ours is a nine-week course, and we try to teach you all phases um, of taxidermy. We teach you large mammals, small mammals, birds, fish, game heads. Uh, maybe for next Thursday, if uh, something doesn't come up, we should show them the students' works because sure. um, we have the class in session and they're finishing up um, some things and it, they have some really, really good, good looking work. I tell every student the first day of class with what you complete here, most of it will be, you'll, it'll be better than 75% of the people making a living at it. Um, now granted, we were there and we were coaching them and telling them right from wrong. Um, but we try to instill in them enough confidence that they can go home, start doing their own work to build up more confidence and be able to do customer work. Um, but it's nine weeks and we try to teach them large game, small game, um, birds, fish, birds, bird fish habitat, record keeping, um, state and federal laws, um, habitat, the business aspect. Um, business. This morning we had uh, advertising, yesterday we had uh, pricing because it's very important um, tax firms sometimes aren't very good business people, so we try to teach them, you know, if this cost $20 and if this cost $30, they, that's, uh, you know, $50, they can't sell it for $40. You know? They're artists. They don't think about that stuff. Yeah. They're making it free. I always say a tax firm slash businessman is an oxymoron. Um, they aren't such thing. They have to be trained. Um, so anyway, we have the business. We have the advertising. We have to have, we try to cover everything. And they all take home what they do here, and they do some tremendous, tremendous projects. You definitely walk away with going to the Northwest Iowa School Tax Room. You definitely walk away with a great base to start your own business. And we're always available for Tech Line, so you kind of leave here knowing that you can call and ask questions, and our customers do too, because we have the products, we've used most of them. We can answer your questions and walk you through any kind of hiccup that comes your Are way. Are we in any bubbles? I don't see any bubbles going across. Can you show? Can you show my dad some bubbles, people? Some likes and some love. There you go. There's one. Oh, there's one. There's one. Mike yeah. Zimmer Zimmerman says, "Class of 1995 here." Nice. Holy smokes, Mike! That makes you very old, doesn't it? <laughs> David Compton says, "I'm really looking forward to it." See, um, it's a it's a great deal. Come with an open mind and and give us something to work with, and we will turn you into something. Yeah, we have openings in our spring class coming up. When is that coming up? Spring. April. April. First week April. Third. Maybe. Yeah. I think third. Yep. So call us. Oh, there's all your bubbles. Oh, thank you, everybody. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, no, the class is a good, it's a good deal. And I don't know how I would have ever started a business without that. I mean, I, I tried doing tax for me. It was pretty ugly. You know, it was bad. Well, that's where the supply company came from because then you were ordering all the stuff for the students. Sure. So then you started sure. getting the stuff here. Sure. Growing, growing. Here's um, another cool base. Look at that. Oh, your shale rock one. Yeah. This is uh, this is a nice base for. You can do all kinds of things. You can do a pedestal on it. We've done um, deer pedestals, antelope pedestals. Um, here's another. Really, comes in a couple different versions. Strong, strong, strong um, foam. Painted. Where so, are we located? Spirit Lake, Iowa, northwest corner of Iowa. 12 miles from Minnesota and about 60 miles from South Dakota and about 20 miles from Spencer. <laughs> 28. 28. Uh, Jeff Baker, class of 91. I like ah. it. Um, Jeff Baker comes and helps us a lot. He's a fellow taxidermist in town here and has a great little shop and we like it when Jeff comes and visits and helps. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to a couple more shows coming up. Um, I know the South Dakota one is coming pretty fast and then the Iowa and Minnesota and we're gonna hit both of those the same weekend. So for those of you that are going to the shows, usually we have like a crazy display of stuff. 
we are not going we're to be scaling back we're because scaling it's so a much lot work. Of work. Um, so we're not bringing as much stuff. So you definitely want to call and take advantage of the free shipping and the show discount and have us bring your orders because we are you're not going to be able to come and be like, oh, do you have this and this and this? We don't. So definitely take advantage of your pre-sales and get your show discount and stuff. For the Wisconsin show, the Wisconsin people are whitetail enthusiasts for sure. And they love the competitor's choice deer forms because they're modeled after our Midwestern deer. They're measured from our Midwestern deer, carcass cast from our Midwestern deer, and they fit beautifully. At Wisconsin show, we had a trailer with 180 some deer forms. We, I was pushing them into the trailer with a stick. I think you had more than that. We might have had more than that. And that <laughs> didn't include what we've sent since because people kind of, they're very popular. Yeah, so what it is kind of a first come first serve as far as that goes because the trailer can only hold so much. But And at the World call. Show we broke an axle and blew a tire. So. And you had to unload three times? Twice. Three, twice, twice. <laughs> All those forms twice by yourself I think too. <laughs> Uh, um, what are you going to raffle today? Joe Martin, that is a fantastic question. What do you want to give away today? Well, how about, um, what does Joe Martin mount, do you think? <laughs> what would you like to win? What would you like to win, Joe? Um, should we do this? Yeah, go for it. Um, this is a nice little base. One of our artificial bases. Um, it's got some moss on it, a couple little rock clusters. It would look good on the table for a little mammal walking on it. It would look good up and down. It would look good sideways. It would look good in your shop. <laughs> and your customers will love it. So let's give that baby away. Um, Kirsten, did you think of any questions today for us? Um, kind of like the last one we've done, but. Okay. Well, this is a last minute deal. It is, because we weren't even thinking about it. How about Oh, the cover. The last is that the, the last this one. This was the winner of the world show. World show. What? Right? Is that how you'd say that? What? Sure. What, what, sure. Sh sure. What was the winner? Did you say winner? Sure. Or what was the grand? I don't know. What was the winner of the world 2017 world show? It's also on the re most recent cover of Breakthrough. No, not most recent. Issue 125. Issue 125, Spring I'm sorry. 2007. Spring 2007. You guys are really reaching for your question. <laughs> really? Okay. First person that comes up with what yeah, it is. Hit. This is endangered. First person to come up with what it is. Yeah. Wins this. <laughs> um, don't forget to like. Give us some more likes because we like to see the bubbles. Um... And you can call us 1-800-488-3256 or visit us online at www.matuskataxidermy.com. We're going to be doing these live videos every Thursday. Who won it? Ooh. Ooh. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. Well, let's ask him. Okay. We have two very similar answers. What would you say this is? This is. To me, it's a red panda. So we're gonna have to go with Ron Graham. Dusty, I'm. <laughs> Dusty said panda, and then right after. Better have a red panda. Um, Ron Graham. Ron wanted? Graham said red yes. panda. Oh, you know how good this would look. Here it is. With a little <laughs> sprig of pine on it and a little old strut and rough grouse, and nobody will do a nicer rough grouse than Ron Graham's. There you go. All right. Sorry, Dusty, that was so close, but I'm sure you will get it <laughs> next time. Ron, you have this base coming for you. Um, we're going to be doing live videos every Thursday at 4.30 Central Time. Everyone's kind of wondering what time Central Time is. Right now it is 5.30. 5.36, so look at your clocks and figure that out. But um, we're going to be doing it live. I think we have a couple show hiccups, but we'll try to kind of do what we did at the Wisconsin show and walk around and show you stuff. No more ladders. Mandy about fell off the ladder at the Wisconsin show. That was a little scary. <laughs> that was a big ladder. I was shaking. That was, <laughs> that was all your idea. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next week. Thank you.